Welcome to Now, where every movie is either a sequel or a remake. That must mean there are no good stories anymore. Right? Wrong! There are plenty of new stories out there, but it would take time and effort for Hollywood to create them. Sequels and remakes are just cheaper to make, and even though they are almost never as good as the original, Hollywood doesn't care. They'll just pay for ads nonstop to say the movie is great until you finally think, hmm, maybe this will be good, and give them money to watch it. And after you do, do you know what you're going to say? It wasn't as good as the original, and why is everything a sequel or a remake? <laughs> well, we'll have none of that tonight. Tonight we're going to watch my favorite award-winning creepypasta stories. So get ready for some awesome stories. Starting with No End House. Calls for missing persons are all too common in college towns. Most of the time, it's some kid partying late. His mom gets nervous and calls the cops 15 minutes after curfew. More often than not, the kid will just stroll in clearly impaired, while mom is talking to the cops. Other times it's these Romeo and Juliet cases. The kids think they're in love, and they want to get married. But this, this was different. No one would call Michael a party-goer. He did have a girlfriend, but she was just as upset as everyone else. The last record of anyone talking to him was a text message he sent to his girlfriend about an old house and some prize money. She texted him back to see where he was, but he stopped replying. Before I start, it's important for you to know that Peter was a burnout. He and I were friends during our freshman year of college, and continued to talk even after he dropped out. I moved out of the dorms and into a small apartment my junior year. I didn't see Peter as much. We would talk online every now and then, and text here and there. But that was it. There was a period where we didn't talk at all for about a month. I wasn't worried. He was a pretty notorious flake and a drug addict, so I assumed he just stopped caring. Then one night I saw he was on Facebook. Before I could initiate a conversation, he sent me a message. Michael, man, we need to talk. That was when he told me about the No End House. It allegedly got that name because no one has ever reached the final exit. It was pretty much the same as any of those silly internet challenges, but this one gave you money. The rules were pretty simple and cliche. Reach the final room of the building and you win $500. There were nine rooms in all. The house was located outside of the city, roughly four miles from where I lived. Apparently, Peter had tried and failed. He was an addict. If he mixed narcotics and the scary challenge together, he'd be so easy to scare, a paper ghost would get the best of him. He told me it would be too much for anyone, that it was unnatural. I didn't believe him. I told him I would check it out the next night, and no matter how hard he tried to convince me otherwise, $500 sounded too good to be true. I had to go. I set out the following night. When I arrived, I immediately noticed something strange about the building. Have you ever seen or read something that shouldn't be scary, but for some reason, a chill crawls up your spine? I brushed off the chill and walked towards the building. The feeling of uneasiness only intensified as I opened the front door. My heart slowed, and I let a relief sigh leave me as I entered. The room looked like a normal hotel lobby, decorated for Halloween. A sign was posted in place of a worker. It read, Room 1, this way. Eight more to follow. Reach the end, and you win. I chuckled and made my way to the first door. The first area was almost laughable. The decor resembled the Halloween aisle of a Kmart, complete with sheet ghosts and animatronic zombies that gave out a static crawl when you passed by. At the far end was an exit. It was the only door besides the one I entered through. I brushed through the kitty Halloween decorations and headed for the second room. I was greeted by fog as I opened the door to room two. It definitely upped the ante in terms of technology. Not only was there a fog machine, 
but a bat hung from the ceiling and flew in a circle. I could hear a Halloween soundtrack playing. The kind that you'd find at a 99 cent store. I didn't see a stereo, but I guess they must have used a PA system. I stepped over a few toy rats that wheeled around and walked with a puff chest across to the next area. I reached the doorknob and my heart sank to my knees. I didn't want to open that door. A feeling of dread hit me so hard I could barely even think. Logic overtook me after a few terrified moments, and I shook it off and entered the next room. Room 3 is when things began to change. On the surface, it looked like a normal room. There was a chair in the middle of a wood-paneled floor. A single lamp in the corner did a poor job of lighting the area, casting a few shadows across the floor and walls. That was the problem. Shadows. Plural. In addition to the chair's shadow, there were others, but there was nothing else in the room. I had barely walked in the door and was already terrified. I knew something wasn't right. I didn't even think as I automatically tried to open the door I came through. It was locked from the other side. This set me off. Was someone locking the doors as I progressed? There was no way I would have heard them. Was it a mechanical lock that said automatically? Maybe. But I was too scared to really think. I turned back to the room and the shadows were gone. The chair's shadow remained, but the others were gone. I slowly began to walk. I used to hallucinate when I was a kid, so I wrote off the shadows as a figment of my imagination and began to feel better as I made it to the halfway point of the room. I looked down as I took my steps. That's when I saw it. Or didn't see it. My shadow wasn't there. I didn't have time to scream. I ran as fast as I could to the other door and dove into room 4 without thinking. The fourth room was possibly the most disturbing. As I closed the door, all the light seemed to be sucked out of the room. I stood there, surrounded by darkness, not able to move. I'm not afraid of the dark, never have been, but I was absolutely terrified. All sight had left me. I reached out with my hand to see if I could get any information. All it did was confirm how dark it was. I couldn't even see my hand. But it wasn't just dark. I couldn't hear anything either. It was dead quiet. Even in the quietest of rooms, you can still hear yourself breathing. You can hear yourself being alive. I could not. I began to stumble forward after a few moments, my rapidly beating heart being the only thing I could feel. There was no door in sight. I wasn't even sure there was one this time. The silence was then broken by a low hum. I felt something behind me and quickly spun around but could barely even see my nose. Still, I knew it was there. Regardless of how dark it was, I knew something was there. The hum grew louder and closer. It seemed to surround me, but I knew whatever was causing the noise was in front of me, inching closer. I took a step back. I had never felt that kind of fear. I can't even really describe it. I wasn't even scared I was going to die. I was scared of what the alternative was. I was afraid of what this thing had in store for me. Then the lights flashed for a second and I saw it. Nothing. I saw nothing. And I know I saw nothing there. All at once the room was again plunged into darkness and the hum became a wild screech. I screamed in protest. I couldn't handle hearing this goddamn sound for another minute. I ran backwards away from the noise and fumbled for the door handle. I turned it and fell into room 5. Now before I describe room 5, you have to understand something. I am not a drug user. 
I have had no history of drug abuse or any sort of psychosis, short of the childhood hallucinations I mentioned earlier, and those were limited to when I was really tired or just waking up. I entered with a clear head. After falling in from the previous room, my view of room 5 was from my back, looking up at the ceiling. What I saw didn't scare me. It simply surprised me. Trees had grown into the room and towered above my head. The ceiling in this room was taller than the others, which made me think I was in the center of the house. I got up off the floor, dusted myself off, and took a look around. This was definitely the biggest room of them all. I couldn't even see the door from where I was. Various brush and trees must have blocked my line of sight with the exit. Up to this point, I figured the rooms were going to get scarier, but this was paradise compared to the last room. I also assumed whatever was in room 4 stayed back there. I was incredibly wrong. As I made my way deeper into the room, I began to hear what one would hear if they were in a forest. Chirping bugs. The occasional flap of birds. These sounds appeared to be my only company in the room. That was the thing that bothered me, though. I could hear the bugs and other animals, but I didn't see any of them. I began to wonder how big this house was. From the outside, when I first walked up to it, it looked like a regular house. It was definitely on the bigger side, but this was almost a full forest in here. I could only assume the ceiling existed somewhere above the treetops. I couldn't see any walls either. The only way I knew I was still inside was that the floor matched the other rooms. It had the same standard dark wood paneling. I kept walking, hoping that the next tree I passed would reveal the door. After a few moments of walking, I felt a bug fly onto my arm. I shook it off and kept going. A second later, I felt about ten more land on my skin at different places. I felt them crawl up and down on my arms and legs. A few made their way across my face. I flailed wildly to get them all off, but they just kept crawling. I looked down and let out a muffled scream, maybe more of a whimper to be honest. I didn't see a single bug. Not one bug was on me, but I could feel them crawl. I heard them fly by my face. I could feel them sting my skin, but I couldn't see a single one. I dropped to the ground and began to roll wildly. I was desperate. I hated bugs especially ones I couldn't see or touch. But these bugs could touch me, and they were everywhere. I began to crawl. I had no idea where I was going. The entrance was nowhere in sight, and I still hadn't even seen the exit. So I just crawled. My skin wriggling with the presence of those phantom bugs. After what seemed like hours, I found the door. I grabbed the nearest tree and propped myself up, mindlessly slapping my arms and legs to no avail. I tried to run, but I couldn't. My body was exhausted from crawling and dealing with whatever was on me. I took a few shaky steps to the door, grabbing each tree on the way for support. It was only a few feet away when I heard it, the low hum from before. It was coming from the next room, and it was deeper. I could almost feel it inside my body, like when you stand next to an amp at a concert. The feeling of the bugs on me lessened as the hum grew louder. As I placed my hand on the doorknob, the bugs were completely gone. But I couldn't bring myself to turn the knob. I knew that if I let it go, the bugs would return, and there was no way I would make it back to room 4. I just stood there, my head pressed against the door marked 6, and my hand shakily grasping the knob. The hum was so loud, I couldn't even hear myself think. There was nothing I could do but move on. Room 6 was next. And room 6 was hell. I closed the door behind me, my eyes held shut, and my ears ringing. As the door clicked into place, the hum was gone. I opened my eyes in surprise. The door I had just shut was gone. It was just a wall now. I looked around in shock. The room was identical to room 3. Same chair and lamp, but with the correct amount of shadows this time. The only real difference was that there was no exit door, and the one I came in through was gone. As I said before, 
I had no previous issues in terms of mental instability. But at that moment, I fell into insanity. I didn't scream. I didn't make a sound. At first, I scratched softly. The wall was tough, but I knew the door was there somewhere. I just knew it was. I scratched at where the doorknob was. I clawed at the wall frantically with both hands, my nails being filed down to the skin against the wood. I fell silently to my knees. The only sound in the room was me scratching against the wall. I knew it was just there. I knew if I could just get past this wall. Are you alright? I jumped off the ground and spun in one motion. I leaned against the wall behind me and saw what it was that spoke to me. I regret ever turning around. There was a little girl, wearing a soft white dress. She had blonde hair, white skin, and blue eyes. She was the most frightening thing I had ever seen, and I know that nothing in my life will ever be as unnerving as what I saw in her. Where she stood, I saw what looked like a man's body, only larger than normal. It wasn't the devil, but at that moment it might as well have been. It was horrifying, and it was synonymous with the little girl. They were the same creature. I can't really describe it, but I saw them at the same time. They shared the same spot. But it was like looking at two separate dimensions. When the girl would come in clearer, the form would vanish, and when the form came in clearer, the girl would vanish. I couldn't speak. My mind was revolting against what it was attempting to process. I had been scared before in my life, and had never been more scared than when I was trapped in that fourth room. But that was before room six. I just stood there, staring at whatever it was that spoke to me. There was no exit. I was trapped here with it. And then it spoke again. Michael, you should have Michael, listened. Michael, you should have listened. Michael, you should have listened. Michael, you should have listened. listened. Michael, you should have listened. Michael, you should have listened. When it spoke, I heard the words of the little girl. But the other form spoke through my mind in a voice I won't attempt to describe. There was no other sound. The voice just kept repeating that sentence over and over and over in my mind. And I agreed. I didn't know what to do. I was slipping into madness yet I couldn't take my eyes off of what was in front of me. I dropped to the floor. I thought I passed out, but the room wouldn't let me. I just wanted it to end. I was on my side, my eyes wide open, and the form staring down at me. Scurrying across the floor in front of me was one of those battery-powered rats from the second room. The house was toying with me, but for some reason, Seeing that rat pulled my mind back from whatever depths it was headed, and I looked around the room. I was getting out of there. I was determined to get out of that house and live and never think about this place again. At first, it was just my eyes that moved. I searched the walls for any opening. The room wasn't very big, so it didn't take long to soak up the entire layout. The demon still taunted me the voice growing louder as the form stayed rooted where it stood. I placed my hand on the floor, lifted myself up on all fours, and turned to scan the wall behind me. The form, that monster, was now right at my back, whispering into my mind how I shouldn't have come. I felt its breath on the back of my neck, but I refused to turn around. When inspecting the wall, I noticed a large rectangle was scratched into the wood with the large seven etched right in the center of it. Somehow in my earlier panic, I must have scratched the seventh door into the wall. I knew what it was. Room seven was just beyond that wall where room five previously existed. Room seven was close. I knew the demon was right behind me, but for some reason it couldn't touch me. I closed my eyes, placed both hands on the large seven, and started pushing. You shouldn't have come here. You shouldn't have come here. You shouldn't have come here. I pushed as hard as I could. The demon was now screaming in my ear. It told me I was never leaving. It told me that this was the end. But I wasn't going to die. I was going to live there in room 6 with it. Forever. 
I was not. I pushed and screamed at the top of my lungs. I knew eventually I would push through that wall. I clenched my eyes shut and screamed, and the demon vanished. I was left in silence. I turned around slowly and was greeted by the room as it was when I entered. Just a chair and a lamp. I couldn't believe it. But I didn't have time to figure out what happened. I just turned back to the wall and jumped back slightly. What I saw was a door. It wasn't the one I scratched in it, but a regular door with the large seven on it. My whole body was shaking. It took me a while to turn the knob. I just stood there for a while, staring at the door. I couldn't stay in room six. I couldn't. But if this was only room six, I couldn't imagine what seven had in store. I must have stood there for an hour, just staring at the seven. Finally, with a deep breath, I twisted the knob and opened the door to room seven. I stumbled through the door, mentally exhausted and physically weak. The door behind me closed and I realized where I was. I was outside. Not outside like room five, but actually outside. My eyes stung. I wanted to cry. I fell to my knees and tried, but I couldn't. I was finally out of that hell. I didn't even care about the prize that was promised. I turned and saw that the door I just went through was the entrance. I walked to my car and drove home, thinking of how nice a shower sounded. As I pulled up to my place, I felt uneasy. The joy of leaving no end house had faded, and dread was slowly building in my stomach. I shook it off as residual from the house and made my way to the door. I entered and immediately went to my room. There on my bed was my cat, Baskerville. He was the first living thing I had seen all night and I reached to pet him. He hissed and swiped at my hand. I recoiled in shock. He'd never acted like that, but he was an old cat, so I guess it was whatever. I jumped in the shower and got ready for what I was expecting to be a sleepless night. After my shower, I went to the kitchen to make something to eat. I walked down the hall and turned into the living room. What I saw there would be forever burned into my mind. My parents were lying on the ground, covered in blood. They were mutilated to near unidentifiable states. Their limbs were removed and placed next to their bodies, and their heads were placed on their chest, facing me. The most unsettling part was their expressions. They were smiling, as though they were happy to see me. All at once I started sobbing there. I didn't know what happened. They didn't even live with me. I was a mess. Then I saw it. A door that was never there before. A door with a large eight scrawled on it in blood. I was still in the house. I was standing in my living room, but I was standing in room seven. The faces of my parents smiled wider as I realized this. They weren't my parents. They couldn't be, but they looked exactly like them. The door marked eight was across the room behind the mutilated bodies in front of me. I knew I had to move on, but at that moment I gave up. The smiling faces tore into my mind. They grounded me where I stood. I nearly collapsed. Then, the hum returned. It was louder than ever, and it filled the house and shook the walls. The hum compelled me to walk. I began to walk, slowly making my way closer to the door and the bodies. I could barely stand, let alone walk, and the closer I got to my parents, the more intense the humming became. The walls were now shaking so hard it seemed as if they were going to crumble, but still, their faces smiled at me. As I inched closer, their eyes followed me. I was now between the two bodies, a few feet away from the door. The dismembered hands crawled their way across the carpet towards me, all while the faces continued to stare. New terror washed over me, and I walked faster. 
I didn't want to hear them speak. I didn't want to hear their voices match the voices of my parents. They began to open their mouths, and their hands were inches from my feet. In a dash of desperation, I lunged towards the door, threw it open, and slammed it behind me. Room 8 I was done. After what I just experienced, I knew there wasn't anything else this house could throw at me. There was nothing short of the fires of hell that I wasn't ready for. Unfortunately, things got more disturbing, more terrifying, and more unspeakable in Room 8. I still have trouble believing what I saw in Room 8. Again, the room was a carbon copy of Rooms 3 and 6, but sitting in the usually empty chair was a man. After a few seconds of disbelief, my mind finally accepted the fact that the man sitting in the chair was me. Not someone that looked like me. It was me. It was Michael. I walked closer. I had to get a better look. Even though I was sure of it. He looked up at me, and I noticed tears in his eyes. Please, please, please don't do it. Please don't, please don't hurt me. What? I asked. Who are you? I'm not going to hurt you. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. He was sobbing now. You're going to hurt me. I know you're going to hurt me, and I don't want you to hurt me. Don't 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 hurt me. He sat in the chair, panicking. It was actually pretty pathetic looking, especially since he was me, identical in every way. Listen, who are you? I was now only a few feet from my doppelganger. It was the weirdest experience yet. Standing there talking to myself, I wasn't scared. But I would be soon. Why are you- You're gonna hurt me, you're gonna hurt me, you're gonna hurt me, you're gonna hurt me. If you wanna leave, you're going to hurt me, don't hurt me. Why are you saying this? Just calm down, alright? Let's try to figure this- And then I saw it. The Michael sitting down was wearing the same clothes as me, except for a small red patch on his shirt. Embroidered with the number 9. You're gonna hurt me, you're gonna hurt me, you're gonna hurt me, please don't, you're gonna hurt me. My eyes didn't leave that small number on his chest. I knew exactly what it was. The first few doors were plain and simple, but after a while they got a little more ambiguous. Seven was scratched into the wall, but by my own hands. Eight was marked in blood above the bodies of my parents, but nine. This number was a person, a living person. Worse still, it was on a person that looked exactly like me. Michael? I had to ask. Yes, you're gonna hurt me, you're gonna hurt me, you're, you're gonna hurt me. He continued to sob. He answered to Michael. He was me. But that nine. I paced around for a few minutes while he sobbed in his chair. The room had no door. And similar to room six, the door I came through was gone. For some reason I knew that scratching would get me nowhere this time. I studied the walls and the floor around the chair, sticking my head underneath and seeing if anything was below. Unfortunately, there was. Below the chair was a knife. Attached was a tag that read, To Michael, from management. The feeling in my stomach as I read that tag was something sinister. I felt sick. The last thing I wanted to do was remove that knife from under the chair. The other Michael was still sobbing uncontrollably, my mind was spinning. I had so many unanswered questions. Who put this here? And how did they get my name? Not to mention the fact that as I knelt on the cold wood floor, I also sat in that chair, sobbing in protest of being hurt by myself. It was all too much to process. The house and the management had been playing with me this whole time. My thoughts for some reason turned to Peter, and whether or not he got this far. And if he did, did he meet a Peter sobbing in this very chair? I shook these thoughts out of my head. They didn't matter. I took the knife from under the chair, and immediately the other Michael went quiet. Michael! He said in a sinister voice. What do you think you're going to do? I lifted myself from the ground and clenched the knife in my hand. I'm going to get out of here. Michael was still sitting in the chair though he was very calm now. He looked up at me with a slight grin. 
I couldn't tell if he was going to laugh or strangle me. Slowly he got up from the chair and stood facing me. It was uncanny. His height, weight, posture, it all matched me. I felt the rubber hilt of the knife in my hand and gripped it tighter. I don't know what I was planning to do with it, but I had a feeling I was going to need it. Now, I'm going to hurt you. I'm going to hurt you and I'm going to keep you here. I didn't respond. I just lunged and tackled him to the ground. I had mounted him and looked down, knife poised and ready. He looked up at me, terrified. It was like I was looking in a mirror. Then the hum returned, low and distant, though I still felt it deep in my body. Michael looked up at me as I looked down at myself. The hum was getting louder, and I felt something inside me snap. With one motion, I slammed the knife into the patch on his chest and ripped down. Blackness fell on the room, and I was falling. The darkness around me was like nothing I had ever experienced. Room 4 was dark, but it didn't come close to what was completely engulfing me. I wasn't even sure if I was falling after a while. I felt weightless, covered in dark. Then a deep sadness came over me. I felt lost, depressed. The sight of my parents entered my mind. I knew it wasn't real, but I had seen it, and the mind has trouble differentiating between what is real and what is not. The sadness only deepened. I was in room 9 for what felt like days. The final room. And that's exactly what it was. The end. No end house had an end, and I had reached it. At that moment, I gave up. I knew I would be in that in-between state forever, accompanied by nothing but darkness. Not even the hum was there to keep me sane. I couldn't see, hear, there were no smells. It was like my senses were stolen from me. I felt disembodied and completely lost. I knew where I was. This was hell. Room 9 was hell. Then it happened. A light. One of those stereotypical lights at the end of the tunnel. I felt the ground come up from below me and I was standing. After a moment or two of gathering my thoughts and senses, I slowly walked towards the light. As I approached the light, it took form. It was a vertical slit down the side of an unmarked door. I slowly walked through the door and found myself back where I started, the lobby of No End House. It was exactly how I left it, still empty, still decorated with childish Halloween decorations. I was still wary of where I was. After a few moments of normalcy, I looked around the place, trying to find anything different. On the desk was a plain white envelope with my name handwritten on it. Immensely curious, yet still cautious, I mustered up the courage to open the envelope. Inside was a letter, again handwritten. To Michael, congratulations. You have made it to the end of No End House. Please accept this prize as a token of this great achievement. Yours forever, Management. With the letter were five $100 bills. I started laughing. I laughed for what seemed like hours. I laughed as I walked out to my car, and I laughed as I drove home. I laughed as I parked my car. I laughed as I approached my door, and I laughed as I looked up and saw the number 10. That was awesome! Let's keep this horror marathon going! We still have the back rooms and a terrifying story about a government experiment gone wrong. The Russian sleep experiment. Ugh. Now don't get everything all mixed up. The back rooms isn't some cakewalk either. There's a place that exists, a dimension, between the walls. Some say you get there by accidentally clipping through, and others say, if the back rooms want you, 
They'll pull you in like a magnet. Maybe make sure you stay away from the walls while you watch this one. Or you might end up in the back. It was about, about 12, 15, when I, you know, got to the Johnson County Community Health Clinic. You know, we called it the J-Dub-C, H-C. And I was there, you know, because I had an appointment. And I set this thing up weeks ago, just a little routine checkup or whatever. And it wasn't, you know, a new place for me. I've been there a whole bunch of times before. Now, the place had a weird kind of feel that just took you back to the old days. You know, it's like it was a location from my childhood, you know, something like that. It's like, I just always felt like I've been there before. And I could never, like, really put my finger on exactly what the feeling was or where it came from, but I just knew that I felt it. Now, when I walked in... I felt this feeling of just like deja vu sweep up over me. And, um, the, you know, they had them fluorescent lights and they had their little hum going. And the floor had this white tile. And it was just a, like a little raggedy, raggedy, like beige paint on the walls. And I think that it was a TV mounted up in the corner. You know, a, a little small flat screen. And it was playing a little PowerPoint presentation thing. And it had ads up there and events that was being held by the clinic and stuff. Now, I passed a little empty waiting area and um, a small area of the main room with magazines and stuff and children play things and little blue cushion chairs and stuff. And I come up on this lady at the front desk and she was sitting in like this bluish gray office chair and um, looking at a spreadsheet on the same like Windows XP <laughs> desktop that they had back since like, man, when they had XP, that was back when I was in high school, man. So I got up to the lady and it was a sign in sheet on the counter. So I started filling out and um, I told her I had an appointment with Dr. Peebins. And she was like, what time? And I'm like, 1230. And then she started typing something on her keyboard and she said, okay, okay, um, Gary Johnston? I said, yeah, that's me. She said, okay, I'll tell the doctor you're here. Please fill this out. Now, she handed me a clipboard, and, you know, just your basic little, you know, form to fill out and stuff. So I walked back to that waiting area, sat down, took a seat, and uh, started filling out the form. Now, I'm about halfway done filling in my information, and I slumped back in the chair a little bit because I really ain't getting no sleep the night before. And I was up, uh, we had a nice little party, man. I was getting my party on last night. But anyway, you know, so I sat back and I seen something real weird, man. It's like, you know, my head never hit the wall. You know, and really it felt like my head went through the wall. So I'm like, you know, I'm expecting to lean back and feel some, you know, the wall. And all of a sudden, I don't feel nothing. So I jumped up looking crazy. And I'm looking at the wall. And I don't see nothing. You know, not a hole in the wall. No dent in the wall. And um, I'm like, man, I know. <laughs> like, you know, I lean back. And I and the wall right behind me, so I should have hit the wall. And I'm looking at the wall, and the wall here, so why didn't my head hit it? And I got it, man, in, in heads, I got to look, my head so big, it don't make no sense, man. I'm talking about, like, I ain't never even been able to wear a hat. I ain't never even seen a hat I could wear. Every time somebody got a hat, and I try to have a go, it's like a, it's like a, a, a man, it, it ain't even... It's like the little thing that the Jewish people be wearing, man. It's like one of them things on my head, man. So, you know, I don't know what size hat I wear. I got to figure that out. People be like, well, you ain't an 8. You, I guess I'm like a... Somebody told me I might be like a 12 or 14. But, you know, it's... I, You know, I take pride in my big head, man. That's why I'm so smart. And my lady told me when I wake up, 
my head be two, three times bigger than it usually is. <laughs> but anyway, you know, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what's going on, man. So I reach out and touch the wall, and my fingers went right through the wall. So I jumped back on some scared stuff. I'm like, man, what was that? My voice got all high, man. And I thought, you know, so I got to be tripping. So I reached and touched the wall again, and the same thing happened. Again, my fingers went right through it. Now, all of a sudden, I lost my balance and tripped and fell straight through the wall. And I fell like face first onto some dirty tan carpet. Now, once I got back up, I realized that I was in a whole nother room. Not really a room, but it was like more like a, a set of rooms. Like each room led to another room, but it was all one big room. And um and all because the doors there weren't no doors. It was like each room was just open, man. You know, it's kind of like having an office space, and everybody be in the office building, and they got their little computer, they little what you call them, them little cubes they be sitting in or whatever. It's like they, you know, the rooms like that. It was just a bunch of mini spaces, <laughs> whatever, man. But anyway, and um. The walls was just covered in this, like tan pattern wallpaper, man, and it and it stank, man. And the walls was kind of grungy and stuff, and it was like um, and the stank was like the uh, old um, like a mildew stank, like when you, you know, something get wet and you don't get it out and it just stay wet and then you go find it a couple of weeks later and that junk just got that mildew smell. That's what it smelled like, man. And um. I turned back around. I tried to put my hand back through the wall, but it wouldn't go back through. So now I'm like, man, what going on in here? Man, I can't. So I'm, I'm really finna, I'm, I'm low key finna panic, and I'm trying to stay cool, but I'm really getting ready to panic, man. So I turn around and look back into the room, and there wasn't no windows. No doors, nothing on the walls, just a, you know, stinking wallpaper or whatever. And it was just completely empty, man. Like, the only thing, you know, it was like a, a plastic blue school chair was the only thing I could see in there. So now at this point, the only thing going through my head was just not just regular fear. Like, this was, this was ultimate super duper fear <laughs> this was this was fear fear this was so i was so scared that i can't even put it in words man that's all i can tell you. i can't even put it in words man and i just kept my mind just said bro you gotta get out of here bro you gotta get out of here bro you gotta get out of here and uh it's just like in my head just over and over man and i started running through the rooms man just i'm moving and groove now and i got lost i can't remember what room i first came in and then and I'm just moving to each room, and each room looked just like the last room. And I'm sorry, and I couldn't find no way out of nothing, man. So now, now I start thinking like, you know, is this this is it? I'm finna die. I'm finna die up in this place, man. I'm finna starve the freaking death up in this place. And my plan, I had them them wings. I had went and got some wings from this place. You know, I'm down here in ATL, but they doing just like Chicago, man. I had the wings. I was going to go over there and get me about a, a 50 piece all to myself, man. And, and now I'm sitting up here thinking I'm going to starve to death up in this place, man. And it had to be. I'm just, and I'm like trying to reason with myself, like, bro, it got to be a way out of here. You know, I wasn't just going to be left up in here forever. It's impossible. Ain't no place just just a forever place like this man you know somebody gonna see i'm gone and uh and you know the doctor should be looking for me you know something gonna happen but ain't nothing ever happened nobody ever called came or nothing and, you know i had my phone on me but um of course you know when you're in a horror movie situation you don't get no signal and every time i tried to call out i just got that that like uh, some kind of stupid little beeping type noise, like like the, you know, the no signal noise or whatever. And now just when I started to just, like I was finna break down in tears, I heard something from a little bit away. 
some footsteps, man. But not no normal human footsteps. You know, it was like a, I, I don't know, it, it just sounded, the, the pattern wasn't right. You know, it wasn't like the way humans walk. It just didn't sound like one, two, one, two, or whatever, or, or one, two. It was weird, man, just off. Almost like they was dragging their foot some. And, the, and the, so now I'm like this thing whatever it is sound like it's dragging his foot and I can hear like a a gurgling you know like a, a like a type you know like a, a a gurgling zombie type noise man so now I look I ain't gonna say <laughs> that I I ain't gonna say I ran I ruined it. <laughs> I ruined it, man. I ruined it like ain't nobody ever ruined it before in the history of running. Then I was moving through them rooms, left and right, hitting my elbow and stuff. Keep going, hit my jam, my toe, everything. I'm still moving. Nothing making me stop, man. So now I'm starting to feel myself get tired, and you know I'm just running, trying to push through it, push through it, push through it, push through it. But eventually. It's only so much, man. You know, the human body only built for so much. <sighs> so I finally just kind of fell out. And I was still trying to crawl and just do the best I could, man. It seemed like I was running for days, man. And no matter where I went, I just still kept ending up in the same rooms. Over and over. Over and over. You know, at least it looked like the same room. I couldn't tell the mugs apart, you know, not really. And I sat down, man. I'm just defeated, man. And this feeling of fear just continued to just be all up in me, man. I started crying, man. And I knew I was going to die up in here. And I'm still here. And I haven't left from up in here. And I didn't just, I didn't just accept my fate, man. Matter of fact, you know those footsteps come every now and then, and I realized that if I just run for a little bit, he'll leave me alone. Sooner or later, I ain't gonna have the energy to run from that man no more. And I'm gonna have to face him. And when I do face him, I'm gonna beat the, I'm gonna beat the dog mess out of that boy. I wonder if the back rooms ever takes in an Uber Eats driver or a pizza delivery driver. At least they'd have some food for a while. Hmm. Our final story tonight is called The Russian Sleep Experiment. Some people claim the story is true. Governments have done many terrible things, claiming it's all for the greater good. I don't know whether this story is real or not, but I do know this story is terrifying. Russian researchers in the 1940s kept five people awake in a top secret base for 15 days using an experimental gas-based stimulant. Because the gas was toxic in high concentrations, they were kept in a sealed environment where oxygen intake was carefully monitored. This was done before closed circuit cameras, so they had only microphones and a few small five inch thick glass windows. The chamber was stocked with books, cots to sleep on, but no bedding, running water, a toilet, and enough dried food to last all five over a month. The test subjects were political prisoners, deemed enemies of the state during the war. For the first five days, everything was fine. The subjects hardly complained having been promised falsely that they would be freed if they submitted to the test and did not sleep for 720 hours. 30 days. Their conversations and activity were monitored, 
and it was noted that they continued to talk about increasingly traumatic events in their past. After being awake for 96 hours, the conversations began to take a strange macabre turn, but other than the subject matter being spoken of, nothing was noteworthy. After 120 hours, they started to complain about the circumstances and events that led them to where they were, and started to demonstrate severe paranoia. They stopped talking to each other, and began alternately whispering to the microphones and the one-way mirrored windows. Oddly, they all seemed to think they could win the trust of the experimenters by turning on their comrades. A note was made, and the frequency, intensity, and duration of these attempts were logged to see if they would increase over time, and possibly with the amount of stimulant gas released into the chamber. After nine days, 216 hours awake, the first of them started screaming. He ran the length of the chamber repeatedly yelling at the top of his lungs for three hours straight. After that, he continued attempting to scream, but was only able to produce occasional squeaks as he sat and rocked in the corner. The researchers reasoned that he had physically torn his vocal cords from screaming. However, even stranger than this event was how the other captives reacted to it, or rather, didn't react. They continued whispering to the microphones, which was what they were doing almost exclusively at this point. That is, until the second of the captives started to scream. The three non-screaming captives calmly walked over to the bookshelf and started tearing them apart. Then, using a combination of toilet water and fecal matter, they began pasting the pages to the windows, blocking the scientist's view. Once all the windows were covered, the screaming stopped. So did the whisperings to the microphones. After three more days passed, the researchers started checking the microphones hourly to make sure they were working. Everything on their end looked good. At one point, they had a soldier tap the door one time. The microphones inside picked up the sound. The oxygen consumption in the chamber indicated that all five must still be alive. In fact, it was the amount of oxygen five people would consume at a very heavy level of strenuous exercise. On the morning of the 14th day, the researchers did something they said they would not do to get the attention from the captives. They used the intercom inside the chamber, hoping to provoke any response from the captives they were afraid were either dead or unconscious. They announced, We are opening the chamber to test the microphones. Step away from the door and lie flat on the floor or you will be shot. Compliance will earn one of you your immediate freedom. To their surprise, they heard a single phrase in a calm voice respond. We no longer want to be freed. Debate broke out among the researchers and the military personnel involved in the research. Unable to provoke any more response using the intercom, it was finally decided to open the chamber at midnight on the 15th day. The chamber was flushed of the stimulant gas and filled with fresh air, and immediately voices from the microphones began to object. Three different voices began begging as if pleading for the life of loved ones to turn the gas back on. The chamber was open and soldiers were sent in to retrieve the test subjects. They began to scream louder than ever, and so did the soldiers when they saw what was inside. Four of the five test subjects were still alive. Although no one could rightly call the state they were in, life, the food rations past day five were left untouched. There were chunks of meat from the dead test subjects' thighs and chests stuffed into the drain in the center of the chamber, allowing four inches of water and blood to accumulate on the floor. All four surviving test subjects had large portions of their muscle and skin torn away from their bodies. The destruction of flesh and exposed bone on their fingertips indicated that the wounds were inflicted by hand, not with teeth, as researchers initially thought. Closer examination of the position and angles of the wounds indicated that most, if not all of them, were self-inflicted. Some abdominal organs below the ribcage of all four test subjects had been removed, while the heart, lungs, and diaphragm remained in place. The skin and much of the muscles attached to the ribs had been ripped off, exposing the lungs through the ribcage. All the blood vessels and organs remained intact. They had just been taken out and laid on the floor, fanning out around the eviscerated but still living bodies of the subjects. The digestive tract of all four could be seen working, digesting food. It quickly became apparent that what they were digesting was their own flesh that they had ripped off and eaten over the course of the days. 
Because of the clearances necessary for this experiment, nearly every Russian soldier was a Spetsnaz operative. But still, many refused to return to the chamber to remove the test subjects. The test subjects continued to scream to be left in the chamber, and alternately begged and demanded the gas be turned back on. To everyone's surprise, the test subjects put up a fierce fight in the process of being removed from the chamber. One of the Russian soldiers died from having his throat ripped out. Another was gravely injured by having a portion of his femur ripped off, causing uncontrollable bleeding. Another five of the soldiers lost their lives, if you count the ones that ended their own lives in the weeks following the incident. In the struggle, one of the four living subjects had his spleen ruptured, and he bled out almost immediately. The medical researchers attempted to sedate him, but were unable to. He was injected with more than ten times the normal dose of a morphine derivative, and still fought like a cornered animal breaking the ribs and arm of one doctor. His heart was seen beating for a full two minutes after he'd bled out to the point there was more air in his vascular system than blood. Even after it stopped, he continued to scream and flail for another three minutes, struggling to attack anyone in reach and just repeating the word, more, over and over, weaker and weaker, until he finally fell silent. The surviving three test subjects were heavily restrained and moved to a medical facility. The two with intact vocal cords continuously begging for the gas, demanding to be kept awake. The most injured of the three was taken to the only surgical operating room in the facility. In the process of preparing the subject to have his organs placed back within his body, it was found he was effectively immune to the sedative they had given him to prepare him for surgery. He fought furiously against his restraints when the anesthetic gas was brought out to put him under. He managed to tear most of the way through a 4 inch wide leather strap on one wrist even through the weight of a 200 pound soldier holding that wrist as well. It only took a little more anesthetic gas than normal to put him under. In the instant his eyelids fluttered and closed, his heart stopped. In the autopsy of the test subject that had died on the table, it was found that his blood had tripled the normal oxygen level. His muscles that were still attached to his skeleton were badly torn, and he had broken nine bones in his struggle to not be subdued. Most of them were from the force of his own muscles. The second survivor had been the first of the group of five to start screaming. His vocal cords were destroyed. He was unable to beg or object to surgery, and he only reacted by shaking his head violently in disapproval when the anesthetic gas was brought near him. He shook his head yes when someone suggested, reluctantly, that they try the surgery without the anesthetic, and he did not react for the entire six-hour procedure of replacing his missing organs and attempting to cover them with what remained of his skin. The surgeon presiding stated repeatedly that it should be medically impossible for the patient to still be alive. One terrified nurse assisting the surgery stated that she had seen the patient's mouth curl into a smile several times whenever his eyes met hers. When the surgery ended, the subject looked at the surgeon and began to wheeze loudly, attempting to talk while struggling. Assuming this must be something of drastic importance, the surgeon sent for a pen and pad so the patient could write his message. When he got it, the message was simple. Keep cutting. The other two test subjects were given the same surgery, both without anesthetic as well. They had to be injected with the paralytic for the duration of the operation. It was necessary to stop the patients from laughing. The surgeon found it impossible to perform the operation while the patients laughed maniacally. Once paralyzed, the subjects could only follow the attending researchers with their eyes. The paralytic cleared their system in an abnormally short amount of time, and they were soon trying to escape their bonds. The moment they could speak, they were again asking for the stimulant gas. The researchers tried asking why they had injured themselves, why they ripped out their own guts, and why they wanted to be given the gas again. Only one reply was given. I must remain awake. All three subjects' restraints were reinforced, and they were placed back in the chamber, awaiting determination as to what's to be done with them. The researchers, facing the wrath of their military benefactors for having failed the stated goals of their project, considered euthanizing the surviving subjects. The commanding officer, an ex-KGB, instead saw potential and wanted to see what would happen if they were put back on the gas. The researchers strongly objected, but were overruled. In preparation for being sealed in the chamber again, the subjects were connected to an EEG monitor and had their restraints padded for long-term confinement. To everyone's surprise, all three stopped struggling the moment it was let slip that they were going back on the gas. 
It was obvious at this point all three were putting up a great struggle to stay awake. One subject that could speak was humming loudly and continuously. The mute subject was straining his legs against the leather bonds with all his might. First left, then right, then left again, for something to focus on. The remaining subject was holding his head off his pillow and blinking rapidly. Having been the first to be wired for EEG, most of the researchers were monitoring his brain waves in surprise. They were normal most of the time, but sometimes would flatline inexplicably. It looked as if he were repeatedly suffering brain death before returning to normal. As they focused on the paper scrolling out of the brainwave monitor, only one nurse saw his eyes slip shut at the same moment his head hit the pillow, then flatlined for the last time as his heart simultaneously stopped. The only remaining subject that could speak started screaming to be sealed in now. His brainwaves showed the same flat lines as the one who just died from falling asleep. The commanding officer gave the order to seal the chamber immediately, with both subjects inside, as well as three researchers. One of the three researchers immediately drew his gun and shot the commander point blank between the eyes, then turned the gun on the mute subject and blew his brains out as well. He pointed his gun at the remaining subject, still restrained to the bed, as the remaining members of the medical research team fled the room. I won't be locked in here with these things. Not with you. What are you? He demanded. I must know. The subject smiled. Have you forgotten so easily? The subject asked. We are you. We are the madness that lurks within you all, begging to be free at every moment in your deepest animal mind. We are what you hide from in your beds every night. We are what you sedate into silence and paralysis when you go into the nocturnal haven where we cannot tread. The researcher paused, then aimed at the subject's heart and fired. The EEG flatlined as the subject weakly choked out. So, <coughs> nearly free. Did you subscribe yet? I hope you did, and that you rang that bell. I have so many stories I can share. Thank you for every comment. They help show my channel isn't trash. If you're in the mood for more stories, The Outsiders is one of my favorite stories, but not many people have heard it. If you want to be among the few that have heard it, click here. Until next time, take good care of yourself.